The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi there, everybody. Welcome to uh, to our webinar today, looking at motivation. Um, I just want to make sure that I'm being heard. Uh, we've had a few issues with sound, so could I just ask if you if you're at your keyboard, could you just go to the question box and type in the word clear? That just lets me know that I am actually coming across clear. That would be really helpful. Okay, thanks, Joyce. Thanks, Nick. Great. All right. Okay. Look, I'll assume that it's all all good. Um, so let's launch into today's topic. So we had a session, of course, this morning um, with the with the group and looking at at this topic. And of course, what I'm wanting to do here today with you is talk very much around the application of some of these. Uh, motivational concepts as well so that as a leader you can think about how you might go about doing these things um, in, a, in a very practical way in the day-to-day -day work that you do without not necessarily taking too much of your time. It's an interesting topic motivation because all of us our motivation ebbs and flows depending on how we're feeling at the time. Our motivational uh, factors change and they can change dramatically. Um, so what motivated you five years ago may not motivate you now. There might be some differences there. And of course, the people that you lead have all got very subjective motivational uh, forces going on. So they all have their own way of looking at the world. And, um, and of course, it's human nature for us to make an assumption, of course, that what motivates you and me is what motivates other people. Um, I'll give you a personal example of that. When I when I was managing, I'd often think that people would rise to the occasion if I gave them a challenge. Some would, of course, and others wouldn't, and that would be very disappointing, and I couldn't quite work that out. So I think, you know, we've got to be very mindful of the fact that everyone's got their own particular approach and their own particular subjective view, and I'm hoping that what this webinar will do is just open your mind up to that so that you can really have a, actually have a conversation with the people that you lead about this topic. And in fact, I'd encourage you to do that. All right. Um, and of course, w Joyce has sent you a, a little uh, kind of a little uh, quiz to do, which looks at the at, at a number of motivational factors and to consider which are important to you and also to consider which of those things do you feel are being fulfilled in your current environment? Um, because we all recognise, of course, that you, you're all going to be on the receiving end of a conversation as well as actually facilitating one. Any, at any rate, what we're going to actually have a look at um, is, is a number of uh, issues today. But um, what, I, uh, what, did I wanted, what I really wanted to talk about today is some myths around motivation. I wanted to talk around some of the um, misleading information there is about motivation. I wanted to talk about what people want out of their work, and that was part of the the pre-work that, that Joyce would have sent you via email. I want to talk about non-job roles and how incredibly important they are. And, uh, and, and of course, I'll end up with talking about some reputable models of motivation, but what I really want to finish up with is some very practical tips on what you can do to get that little extra discretionary effort from the people that you lead. And I, I think, you know, if you rated some of your people on a scale of one to 10, let's say a four out of 10 in terms of their level of engagement and motivation, getting them from a four to a 10 might be a leap too far, but certainly getting them from a four to a five is very achievable. And if you can do that for everybody that's, uh, that you're leading, then you're going to make an incredible difference in terms of uh, the output and the quality of the work that, that you do in your own particular area, sphere of influence. So really, we're looking for small incremental changes, and small incremental changes add up to major changes exponentially across the board. So we're really looking at trying to, to do that in, in this process. 
Um, your homework, of course, uh, was, and I skipped over that, but your homework was, of course, uh, the whole notion of feedback. And I hope you've had a chance to have a check in. I hope you've had a chance to actually, um, you know, get some feedback from the people that you lead and perhaps even give some feedback, whether it's constructive or positive. So we want you to keep practicing and working at that because remember, the more you give feedback, the more the easier it becomes. And don't forget, the more you give feedback, the easier it is to take as well. And don't think for a minute that positive feedback is easy to take. Some people find it very hard to accept positive feedback. So whether it's positive or constructive feedback, people need to be trained to, ac to actually accept feedback. So that becomes really, really important. So keep working at it. Look for opportunities every day on the job, moment by moment, situation by situation. And don't forget the, uh, the SBI model. Explain the situation, talk about the behaviour, and then refer to the impact that that, that behaviour might have either on you or other people in the team. So the SBI model is a very simple way of you being able to really present that feedback in a constructive way. The situation means you're putting it in context. The behaviour means it's actually talking about the specific behaviour of the person. In other words, we're separating the person from the behaviour. So it's the behaviour you're giving feedback about. And ultimately, the impact is very important because sometimes people aren't aware of the positive or negative impact that their behaviour has on other people. And that's, that's why the SBI model is a really great model to use. All right, so let's just launch into today's topic and let's have a look at what I think is your primary role as a leader. Now, I could ask you what you feel is your primary role as a leader. I'm sure I'd get many, many different answers. I think in the context of what we're doing today and in the context of leadership in general, it's really about getting the very best from the people that you lead in your team. Now, the very best may not be a 10 out of 10 as I said, but if you can get that little extra discretionary effort um, from people, then this kind of thing adds up significantly. And I say earlier exponentially because when people's motivation levels go up, they have a positive impact on other people as well. Uh, likewise, when people's motivation goes down and they're quite negative, they have a negative impact on other people. So you can see exponentially a small change can make a big difference. And of course, if it's done right across the whole of Treasury, it makes an enormous difference in terms of productivity. So I want you to think about that and, and ponder the idea that your role is ultimately about getting the best out of each individual. Now, you might say that isn't that their responsibility? Obviously it is, but um, you can create the environment or the climate that perhaps might be easier for people to attune to meeting their motivational levels. So ultimately, motivation is the responsibility of the individual. No question about that. But I don't think as leaders, we should underestimate our ability to create a motivational environment or a demotivational environment, depending on what it is. And people often say, well, I'm not working in a vacuum. In some senses, that's true, but you do have some impact on your immediate area of responsibility, no doubt about that. So um, have a think about that. As, and, and of course, at any stage during this presentation, I'm more than happy to, to receive your comments. I'll actually ask for them at different points. And I'm more than happy for you to, to uh, you know, ask questions and observe and uh, make some observations. So go for your life. Of course, you will receive the copy of the slides you will receive a copy of the recording at the end of this presentation. Okay, now this busy slide that I'm going to show you coming up right now um, really just defines what motivation is. So let's be clear about what we're talking about before we move on to a topic of motivation. So in the circle there, more or less in the centre of your page is a definition of motivation. So just reading through it, there's some key words that we need to ascribe to. Forces within the individual that, it, that account for the level, direction and persistence of effort expended at work. So the first key word there is within. So motivation is actually an inside job. 
uh, you can certainly create motivational stimuli, but ultimately it's up to the individual as to whether or not they decide to be motivated. And that's not an excuse for us not to try. It's actually all the more reason to put in an effort because ultimately it'd be up to the individual. But let me give you an example. I, you and I could both go and uh, see a presentation, whatever it might be, and I could walk out saying that was terrible, I got nothing out of it, and you could walk out all fired up and and uh, with a list of things uh, you know that you can apply and do as a result of that presentation. We both had the same stimuli, which of course was the presenter. The difference was, of course, that we both interpreted their message and that stimuli differently, and as a result of that, we both came out with a different level of motivation or view. So it is an inside job. So uh, that's what I mentioned earlier. Now, the other thing about that definition is the three dimensions to motivation. And this is important for you because when you look at your team members and you notice that perhaps there's a dip in motivation, or maybe they're not quite you know, their normal engaged self, there's three important dimensions you might want to consider. For example, up the top, direction is one of those. One of those. In other words, that's the person's choice about what they, what they focus on. So obviously everyone's got a series of priorities they've got to get done. You might notice that someone's working on a low level priority when they should be working on a high level priority. So the argument would be that that's one of the dimensions of motivation, that is the focus of the person is not quite right. And obviously you can fix that by explaining to people what needs to be done. Um, but often people do need leadership in that area as well. Another important dimension of motivation is the level of persistence. That is how long somebody works at something, how persistent they are to get the end result. And you know, that, that's something, uh, you know, persevering, getting to the end, making sure that I's are dotted and T's crossed, that the, that the activity is done to the best of its, you know, to the best. Now, the third level of motivation or the third uh, dimension, if you like, is the intensity of the effort that's put forth by the person. So that's, you know, people not wasting time, getting stuck into it, doing what, um, uh, I might refer to as deep work, you know, work that's intense and, uh, you know, is productive. So I think this is important for you because instead of looking at someone saying, oh, well, they're not very motivated, what I think we should be doing is looking at someone saying, what aspect of their motivation is lacking here? Is it the direction, in other words, their priorities? Is it perhaps the persistence they're putting into that? And is it or, or could it be the intensity that they're putting into the work that they're doing? Now, obviously, if you ask those questions, you're likely to come up and pinpoint some sort of response. And then your particular response to that could be crafted according to which of those three you think might be lacking. So, for example, if it's direction, then it's obviously reorientating people to a new priority. If it's persistence, it may well be to encourage people during a challenging, uh, you know, while they're putting together some challenging work. Or if it's intensity, it might be just perhaps giving people uh, deadlines or maybe it might be around, um, you know, looking at what's slowing the person up and how you might be able to encourage them. So that sort of adds a little bit more intelligence to the discussion around motivation. Now, what I want to do now is talk about some of the myths around motivation, because there are a lot out there, and I think some of them are misleading and some of them ought to be challenged, because if they're not challenged, um, you'll find that, uh, you know, we, we live by these myths. Now, one of the key myths that are out there at the moment, or have been for a long time, is that you and I cannot actually motivate anybody. Ultimately, as I said earlier, it's their choice about whether they become motivated. So all we can do is create the right environment and ultimately it's up to the person to decide whether or not that environment is sufficiently enough attractive, sufficiently enough attracting, attractive to them to make the decision to become motivated. As I mentioned before, two people can be exposed to the same stimuli. One's motivated, one's not, because they have interpreted that stimuli. So this is quite liberating for you as a manager because why it's liberating is that 
if you just go about your work and create the right environment, and we'll certainly give you plenty of tips on how to do that today, then that's enough. So, but don't think that you can actually, uh, you know, you can't really motivate people in the end. It's up to them. Now, that might seem like a, you know, pretty obvious sort of thing, but I do recall when I was leading people, I thought I could motivate people. It was probably an ego thing. But what I found out, of course, is I couldn't. I'd get very disheartened about it. I'd blame them. I'd blame myself. But at the end of the day, all I can do is create the right environment for those people to make that decision themselves. So that's one thing that's important, the one insight in about, in, into, uh, about motivation. Another one is that everybody actually is motivated to a degree. And I think that for us to make blanket statements around, you know, that person over there is motivated, that one's not, I think would be quite erroneous. We've all, we've all have a degree of motivation. Just getting out of bed this morning um, is a motivation. Now, some people, of course, um, get out of bed because of the fear of the consequences of not getting out of bed and missing deadlines on projects and all the rest of it. Other people, of course, get out of bed because they can't wait to deal with the projects or whatever. So we're all motivated to a certain extent. And I think if you talk to your people and you listen to them in these check-ins, you'll get some really good hints and ideas around what motivates them. And, and I do actually literally want you to have a check-in on that. Um, and don't forget the people that you lead have been, been engaged in a similar sort of process. So um, it's not going to be any surprise to them that you want to talk about motivation with them and what and so forth. And be prepared to share your own motivation as well. You know, what motivates you? But a bit of self-disclosure never hurts in terms of getting the best out of other people. Another concept around motivation that's challenging for lots of people that I alluded to earlier is that motivation is, in fact, very subjective. And ultimately, what that means is that we um, all have different, you know, we have all got different triggers. So, you know, I made that mistake, I'm sure you have, by assuming that other people are motivated by the same things that you are. Not a good idea. So you need to listen, you need to watch, you need to observe, you need to talk to people about these things and find out what it is. Uh, I found it very interesting. I was working in a large retail, um, uh, I guess you could call it a, um, a travel agency, well known throughout Australia. And uh, I got a chance to interview the heads of these retail outlets, and they're usually about five or six people in each outlet. And I simply asked them the question, what motivated them about working in that organisation? I got typical answers like, um, you know, the perks, because of course they got free flights and cheap holidays and all that sort of thing. So there were those things. Other people said that they, um, they really enjoyed um, the status of having their own team to work with and build. Others said that they felt a little bit ashamed of mentioning what they did at barbecues because they felt that it was a low status role and that other people they felt probably had higher status roles. So in other words, they were motivated by status. One person said to me that they were motivated when, a, when, a, when an elderly couple would come back into the store having their one and only world trip and uh, thanking that person profusely for organising all the details for the for the for the, for the um, you know the accommodation and the flights and everything else and they got a huge reward from that sort of recognition. So look, we're all motivated by different things, and I think the important thing is to be aware of that and not impose your particular motives on other people. Another concept around motivation, I'm sure you've heard the concept of intrinsic versus extrinsic motivation. Now, intrinsic meaning inner. Intrinsic motivation is, of course, the, the sort of motivation that we want from people because this is an inner type of motivation. Extrinsic motivation is the use of rewards and punishment or carrots and sticks, as we might euphemistically call them. So these sorts of things um, are used in the workplace to get people to meet KPIs and all the rest of it. Um, but ultimately, the most effective form of motivation is an intrinsic form of motivation. And if you talk to recruiters about this, they'll often tell you 
that the uh, it's far better to to recruit somebody who is intrinsically motivated, who may have a low skill level or lower skill level, than someone that's got a high skill level who doesn't have who isn't intrinsically motivated. Because the argument is that of course, if you're intrinsically motivated, you may well be motivated to learn and grow the skill sets that you need in order to do the job effectively. Now, this one's a bit controversial because, um, you know, we talk about money incessantly in our society, but the reality is the research says that money is an over, well, it doesn't actually say these words, but it, these are my words, but mo money is overestimated as a motivational force. Now, if you actually think about it, um, over above and beyond a discretionary level, money doesn't make a huge difference to people's output or productivity. For example, if you could increase everybody's salary, double double their salary tomorrow, you might find some increases in levels of motivation for the next week or two, and then you'd find that people would probably slide back to old habits. So be above and beyond a certain threshold, money is no longer the motivator that we might consider it to be. Now, obviously, don't misunderstand what I'm saying here. I'm not suggesting that money's not important. I'm, the key word there is overestimated. So um, if obviously, if everyone was not paid in Treasury tomorrow, then I, that's obviously people are going to jump up and down about that and get upset and rightly so. But just by doubling their income at the other end, it's not going to make a huge difference long term either. So I don't know if anyone's got a view about that, but I'd be interested to hear that your view. I think, you know, at the end of the day, money is an extrinsic motivator. It is paper and metal. Obviously, you can buy things with it and do things that are good with that. But ultimately, um, in many respects, it's not always what it's cracked up to be as a motivational driver. Not that you can necessarily do much about that in in the public sector, but nevertheless, it's worth pondering that there are other things that make a difference. Let me give you a personal example, or well, not a personal example, but an example from Queensland. When mining was booming here in Queensland, um, and I'm sure it may be the case uh, where you are too, but when it was booming, there were lots of people in local government who decided to leave um, local government and go and work in the mines. And the rationale, of course, was that you could, uh, you could double your income. So, yeah, it's true. A lot of people did leave. But equally, there were a lot of people that stayed. And when you talk to those people and said, well, why are you staying in government when you could, you know, earn twice as much? And their comment was often, you know, all my friends are here. Um, you know, I've got a nine day fortnight. I've got fantastic working conditions. And you know, on and on and on they went. In other words, there are other factors besides money that drove them. So it's important to consider that as well. Interested if you've got any comments about that. Ultimately, what all this means is that people are motivated by two forces. Every single thing that we do, every single day, in every single moment, is either to avoid pain or to seek pleasure. Now, you might think that's very simplistic, but just think about it for a moment. Everything we do is to seek pleasure and avoid pain. You know, so speaking up at a meeting might be conceived as being painful for, for an introvert, so they don't speak up. For another person, speaking up at a meeting might be very important and seen as pleasurable. I want to make my mark. So the, the key concept here is that each of us actually conceptualise pain and pleasure differently. So what's painful for one person may not be for another. In fact, what's painful for a person may be pleasurable for another and vice versa. Example, two of us are in our own cars. We're both at the traffic lights side by side. We're both late for a meeting and the person on the left hand side uh, is swearing and cursing and waiting for the lights to change because they're so stressed about being late to a meeting. Whereas the person on the right who incidentally is going to the same meeting is just chilling out, listening to some music, and they rationalise that it is what it is. I'm going to be late. There's nothing I can do about it. I'm just going to relax and not let it worry me. Now, the same stimuli is occurring, but one's perceiving that as painful and the other is not. So 
whilst it might say, seem like a simple concept, the reality is that we all conceptualise those things differently. All right, let's move on to these to the survey that I got you to complete, and I hope you had a chance to do that. And I'm going to ask you a question. Uh, you got a list of things from uh, from uh, Joyce, and what you had to do, of course, is to identify which of those things were critical motivators for you. You could have also added to your list as well. But then you're also asked to rate them in terms of the um, whether or not you felt that that motivator was fulfill, fulfilled in your current role. Now, it was important work because it gives you a chance to really think about what's motivating you and what's not motivating you in your work. So what I'm going to ask you to do now is, those of you that can do this, um, I'd like you to type in, what do you, now, well, first of all, I'll explain it. I want you to type in what you think employees indicated was the number one quality there quality they wanted in a job. Now, I'll just give you a hint, it's not money, right? So it's not that. Now, uh, in fact, that wasn't on the top 10. So I want you to list the number one quality that employees want in a job. Now, I should just let you know that this survey was conducted with 9,000 employees across several countries, different cultures, across 21 industries, private sector, public sector, not-for-profit. And all of these people were asked a simple question. Could you please rate your number one uh, you know, quality that you want in a job in a generic sense? So everyone wrote down an answer. So this is a frequency survey. So number one that was on the list was the one that was mentioned the most, number two and so forth. So these are the top 10 things. Now granted, as you can see at the bottom right hand corner, it's a little dated, but nevertheless, it is interesting to reflect on what people are actually saying cross-culturally, cross-industry, uh, what do they think is number one. Would any of you like to have a guess? Would you like to just type in, um, what do you think an employee would indicate to be the number one thing they want in their job, according to this survey? Anyone want to have a go at that? All right, um, no, nothing yet, okay. What do you think might be the number one quality that employees want from their job? And I've already given you a clue and it's not money. So what do you think it might be? Anyone got a guess? Anyone would like to have a little guess? Put your fingers to keyboard and give it a, give it a shot. See if you're right. No, well, well, I realise that probably many of you in a room, uh, maybe that's the reason why. But let me give you, let me um, go through each of these with you. And this is the order. Now, this isn't my information. Remember, this is what 9,000 people have indicated. Number one on the list. Number one on the list is that people want to work for an efficient manager. All right. Now, that's got huge implications for you, of course, because... Um, of course, you know, we want you to be an efficient manager and you may well have that view yourself in terms of, you know, being managed yourself. It's surprising when you see that initially, but it's not that surprising actually, because interestingly enough, you know, the old adage that people don't leave organisations, they leave managers is, I think, very true, particularly in the private sector. And often if the relationship is broken down and there's no trust and um, those two are at loggerheads, it's probably time for that, that person to move on to another job. So ultimately we're looking, or most employees, at least these 9,000 that were surveyed are saying that that's number one, which is significant because it means that, um, you know, the check-ins that we're doing, all of the work that you're doing, all the good work you're trying to do to improve your leadership capabilities is extremely important because it is fulfilling a need. So just by being an efficient manager, according to this survey at least, what you're doing is you're creating an environment that's motivating. Doesn't mean people will be motivated, but at least it's a good start in the right direction and a reasonable chance for that to occur. So that was number one. Number two on the list. People want to be able to think for themselves. Now, 
you're working with what we might refer to as knowledge workers. So you're working with people that have probably got a fairly high skill level. They, um, you know, they come to the job with some training. They know hopefully what they're doing and they want to be able to make choices and decisions about their priorities and how they might go about the work that they do. So people actually want to be able to think for themselves at work. So that probably doesn't surprise any of you. And certainly in my, from my point of view, I'd rate that very highly on a personal level. I could think of nothing worse than to be micromanaged by somebody. I could not think of anything worse. No matter how uh, well intended it was, it would not be a pleasant experience for me. In fact, I think it'd probably be fair to say for anyone, but I value the idea of being able to think for myself. That is critically important to me. Number three on the list is that people want to see the end uh, result of their work. Now, I think in Treasury, that's a little challenging, if I'm not mistaken, in the sense that it's not always easy to have the line of sight from the everyday work that people do to the end result. Uh, whereas if you were working in a not-for-profit that was looking after, you know, getting... Uh, you know, looking after homeless youth or getting people off the streets. Obviously, there's a clear line of sight between the work that you're doing and the ultimate uh, result. And so what that implies for you is you need to spend a little bit of time explaining the why of work, what Simon Sinek calls the why of work. What you need to do is you need to explain um, or, or articulate the importance and relevance of that report, where it's going, what difference it could make and so forth and so on. Because don't underestimate um, or don't overestimate, I should say, people's ability to understand the significance of the work that they do. And just to give you an example of that, and again, going back to a local government example, I was working in uh, a council um, a couple of years ago and I actually went into the indoor staff, the office-based workers, and I simply asked them on a scale of one to 10, how they'd rate their current level of motivation. And I got a score coming back of 5.9. So that was, you know, I, I wasn't surprised about that. It wasn't necessarily great, but it wasn't bad. But then I went to the outdoor workforce and the outdoor workforce, of course, were the ones Put, you know, filling potholes, um, mending fences, building bridges, uh, paving roads, uh, clearing gardens, all that kind of stuff. And I asked them the same question and I got a high score, a 6.3. Now that's interesting because the outdoor staff and many perceive them to have a lower level of motivation, had a higher level of motivation than the indoor staff, at least in, in the collective. Now, I spoke to some of the outdoor workers and I said, what is it that you really like about your work? And they said the thing, and this was the overwhelming response. They said, the thing that I like about my work is that I can actually see the finished product. I can see the road that's been paved. I can see the pothole that's been filled. Uh, I can see the garden that's been attended to. And so this is what I mean about a line of sight. And so it's really important to be able to clarify with people what the end result of their work would be. Otherwise, if they see it as meaningless or certainly not meaningful, then it's highly likely, of course, that they're not going to be motivated to complete that as well as they probably could. Number four on the list is to be assigned interesting work. Now, a lot of work, of course, is not terribly exciting. It's true. It wouldn't matter what the role is. Um, there's work that I do that's not terribly exciting. There's work you do that's not very exciting. There's work that your, that, that, that your colleagues and your teams do that are not exciting. But there is always an opportunity and a scope <clears throat> to give people a little bit of variety. There's always the opportunity of being able to give people new experiences and give them an opportunity to try new things. Um, that's what this is talking about. And if it's number four on the list of 9,000 employees, then it probably implies that it is important that people need to feel a sense of stimulation from the work that they do. So what can you do in that regard to, uh, to assist people 
to to in, to be more stimulated in the work they do. So is there something you can do? And if there isn't anything you can do about it, have a conversation about it because um, otherwise the person might think that there is something you can do about it when in actual fact you can't. Number five on the list is that people want to be kept informed. And what this means, of course, is that there's two types of being of, of information that people want. They want to know what's happening with the department. They want to know, generally speaking, uh, where the organisation's headed. And if there are changes and focus and all the rest of it, they want to know those things. So don't underestimate that. If you, you know, in your meetings with, you know, in your team meetings, explain things to people. The other thing that they want is they want information on how they're performing and tracking against their own KPIs. They want to know whether they're exceeding expectations or not. They want positive and constructive feedback, and that's important. So you may, might recall that graph I showed you last time that indicated that if you don't give people any feedback, you're going to have a disengaged workforce. And so this number five feeds into that. People want to be informed about how they're going in their work. So make sure that you keep giving people feedback on a regular basis. Uh, you know, it's really important to do that. You're fulfilling one of those obligations. And then the other one, of course, is to let people know what's going on inside the organisation. People want to be listened to. Um, and what that means is that, it, I mean, that's easier said than done because I understand that, you know, the last three things someone said were really a waste of time or, in my view, had no relevance. And this is the fourth thing, and you've already tuned out before they've even opened their mouth. They know that because they can see it on your face. So you, this listening part is really important. This is one of the re reasons uh, check-ins at Treasury is such an important project because it's your opportunity to genuinely listen to what people have got to say about what, whatever it is you want to talk about. So, you know, um, it's number six on the list. People want to be listened to. And that's hard sometimes, but it's important to craft that skill of being able to listen to people. Uh, number six. Number seven, they want to be respected. Now, I know there's some people in your team you may not respect. But the reality is, as a human being, fundamentally, they have a right to earn some degree of respect just by being a human being. So I think what we've got to do is we've just got to be respectful to people. And a lot of that is just simple things like saying thank you, apologising when you made a mistake, uh, showing appropriate vulnerability when it's right, being authentic. All of those things add to this whole uh, recipe of being respected. So they want to be respected as well. Of course, as I said, you need to be respected and they need to be respected. So it was number seven on the list. So it's obviously important to people. Number nine, number eight on the list is to be recognised for their efforts. Now, this doesn't mean you've got to down tools and have a morning tea and, and celebrate, but what it does mean is that um, you should, wherever possible, let people know that you are happy with what they're doing, if in fact that is the case. And, you know, uh, you were given that homework to find three positive things going right, let people know, recognize, that's what recognition is. So just saying thank you to someone is actually recognition. And so it's very easy to do. It doesn't take much time, but interesting enough, it ticks one of these 10 boxes and that's important as well apart from the fact that you do, in fact, recognise their effort. Because when you recognise effort, it's not just the recognition of the effort, it's also the fact that they know that you've noticed. Okay, so there's a lot more than just giving the, you know, the thank you or whatever. They know that you know. They know that you've noticed, and that's important. So recognise people's effort. Number nine on the list is they want that some people, in this case, nine, number nine on the list, want to be challenged. They want to be stretched. They want to be developed. They want to do, make a difference. And all of these things are important. Just be careful with this one, though. I mean, you might have a very strong desire 
to be challenged in the work that you do, just remember that everyone's threshold for challenge is different. So not everyone wants to be perhaps stretched to the same level that you are, but nevertheless, it is number nine on a list of 9,000 people who fill this survey out so that it obviously is important to people to feel that they're being stretched somewhat in the work that they do. And the last one on the list is to have the opportunity to increase their skills. So skill development and the ability to exercise their skills is really important. A little framework that I put together a couple of years ago, which looks at any sort of learning or skill development, there's three different sort of dimensions, if you like. One is the technical skills they're required to do their technical job. Obviously, that's important and to continually grow and develop that way. Another one is personal development, that is developing themselves as a person. And by developing someone themselves as a person, it can often help them develop to improve their work performance. So for example, um, learning you know, how to prioritize and manage their time, learning about how to deal with difficult situations, all that requires personal development. But all of those things, of course, contribute to technical know-how as well at the end of the day. So there it is. These are the 10 things that people want in their work. Now, the point about this is that uh, you, if you try the best you can to, to implement or create an environment where all of these 10 things are being done, then you have a very good chance of being able to bump up your odds of other people in your team making a decision to become motivated. And that's the good news because all of those 10 things are important to 9,000 people. And you could probably be pretty confident that they, you're the people you lead, probably feel the same way. Now, when you, you are asked to look at those 10 things and determine which is more important and whether you're being fulfilled in that area, I would encourage you strongly to have a conversation, a check-in with your manager about this list. I'd really encourage you to do that. I'd encourage you to talk about that because if you let people know what drives you and what motivates you, you're not making yourself vulnerable actually. You're actually making you're actually helpful. I mean if you if if I was your boss and you came to me and you wanted to talk about this list and you identified some things on this list that were important to you and you gave me some context around that I'm going to be in a stronger position to be able to create the environment that might get the best out of you, you see. So I also encourage you to have a conversation with the people that you lead around this list as well. And I've asked your people to feel comfortable having a conversation with you about it. So I want to try and create a little bit of, you know, some check-ins around in this organisation really around people's levels of motivation. So I want you to have a go at that and give it everything you can because I think you'll find it very stimulating. I, I know you'll find it useful and you'll hear some interesting things as well, no doubt. Now, I think, you know, this leads in, this feeds into this question here. If you have one person who's just not motivated, what do you do? Now, you know, as again, I mentioned before, the, the term motivated is too broad, but let's assume that they're not particularly inspired. What's the best way of, um, what do you do about that? Well, what you do, in my view, is you ask them. So what could you ask them? And you can do this in a check-in, of course. So one of the questions that you might be able to ask is, is there anything that I'm doing or not doing that can help you to be more engaged in your work? So just get straight to the heart of it because um, by asking that sort of question, you're putting the onus or some of the onus of responsibility on yourself to change. And you're probably also implying that you're willing to change if you knew what it was. So have a conversation with that. Now, when you ask that sort of question, you're probably going to get, you know, you may you may not get a full answer. Persevere, use poor, you know, use some silence, uh, ask some follow-up questions, try and draw the person out, 
because clearly the more you can do that, the more likely it is you'll be able to do what it is that you think you need to do to get the very best from the people that you lead. So there's a thought. So you can do that in check-ins. And really, you're doing that indirectly in many respects by just talking about these 10 things. Having a good conversation about it can make all the difference. Now, I want to talk about this concept of non-job roles. I think it's extremely important for you as a leader. Um, I want to talk about the work that you do. The work that people do is basically two-dimensional. Let me just put this up and you can see. So one dimension of work is captured in the job description and that dimension is the KPIs, it's the technical know-how, it's you know all the, all, the, all the tasks, all the key result areas that people do. And normally that's captured in a document we call a job description. This comes from my, one of my books that I, I put this together a couple of years ago. Now, there is another dimension that's often misunderstood or, or certainly not, it's overlooked basically. And I, but I still think that it's critically important to performance. And this dimension is not captured in the job description. And they, therefore we call it non-job roles. Now for about 25 years, academics have been arguing about this and they argue the relevance of non-job roles, but they couldn't really bring themselves to come to a generic list that would uh, you know, be applicable across all industries. So I thought I'd bite the bullet and have a go at this. And I've come up with four that I think are critically important. Let's have a look at them. The first important non-job role that your people can exhibit and will play, maybe that's a better way of putting it, is to have a positive attitude. Now, I mean, I don't expect people to be bouncing off the walls at work. That's not going to happen anyway with excitement. I mean, I'm not, that's not what I'm talking about. But I, I don't also expect people to come to work backbiting, whinging, moaning, complaining, playing politics, uh, undermining people, sabotaging things. That is not on, in my view. And in fact, I was very strong about that. And you might say to me, but surely that's a very subjective judgment. Not necessarily. I could come into your work area tomorrow and uh, perhaps you didn't have to give me time to fly down there, but I'd come in and I could sit there for 20 minutes and I could watch your people and then you and I could go and have a cup of coffee and I'll guarantee that you and I both agree on who in your workplace is, who, who is not exhibiting a really positive attitude. I, we could tell. So it's not, ironically, it's not that subjective. It's quite clear. It's quite obvious. Um, but we shirk this issue. We don't want to talk about these things. Um, but yet they're so damaging. It only takes one person who, uh, you know, is sabotaging your team and, and it just destroys the performance of the team. So I think that's a non-job role that's applicable right across all industries. It's not necessarily, well, I, very, I don't think I've ever seen it in the job description, but I think it should be. The second job role, the second role that I think is very important is that we want people to be team players. And again, I hear people say, oh, well, I'm not a team player. I like to work on my own. And, but look, that's just not feasible, is it? I mean, the fact of the matter is that people have got to work together. They've got to engage together. And we want people who will interact and have a reasonable way of dealing with other people in teams. So I don't think that's negotiable. And again, it's not really something that's listed in the job description, but I think it should be. I'll get to that in a minute. Another particular role that's critically important is that we want people to develop their careers. Now, I, when I say develop their careers, I don't mean walk out the door. What I'm talking about is building up their skill set. So what we want people to do is to continually grow and develop their skill set. But again, how often do you hear people saying, oh, you know, I'm just happy doing this and I don't, you know, or I'm too old, too old to go to that training course or some other rubbish. And people will say that all the time. They're sabotaging themselves because the world's moving on and they're hanging back. And the second problem with that, of course, is they're sabotaging the team because they're likely to do do their work slower and, and or in a different way. And it means that other people around them have got to compensate for their lack of uh, growth and development. So this role is very much developing themselves. Again, 
you don't see it in the job description. And the final one on the, on the list, I'm sure there are many others, I'm just giving you four or food for thought, is we want, and this one, the difference between this one and the previous one is the innovation and continuous improvement role is about improving the workplace, whereas this other one is about improving the individual. Now, again, you don't see that very often in a job description. So arguably, I would say to you that people have got five roles to play in teams. What are they? They've got a job role, which is of course tied up in their job description, and they have four non-job roles. Now, just think about this. If your team had high technical competence, but yet everyone in that team had a terrible attitude, none of them wanted to work as a team, every single one of them didn't want to take up any opportunity to grow and develop, and none of them came up with any ideas to make the organisation or their workplace more efficient and effective. Do you think they'd be high performing? I don't think so. And the reason is because those non-job roles are not being enacted. So I, 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 you know, I urge you to be bold enough to raise these matters. I don't mean directly, but certainly you have every right and responsibility to be working on the non-job role dimension of performance. Because if you don't, I can assure you, you're not getting the best from the people that you lead. Right, just to finish up on a couple of reputable uh, motivational theories and then we'll be, we'll, be, uh, we'll be done. I'm just conscious of time. Okay, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. I'm sure you've seen it before. Maslow, psychologist in the 1930s, drew this up on a napkin, uh, so, so I read, and uh, he was quite embarrassed about how incredibly successful this became and how incredibly popular it became. It was never actually researched, I might point out. Um, there has been subsequent research on this, but really it, it makes a lot of sense in a practical way. So let's have a look. Basically what Maslow said is that there are a number of different motivators that when they're fulfilled no longer become a motivator and then the, another level of motivation comes into play. Now in your workplace and in mine and the Western world in general, we don't have a survival issue. This is air, food and water. So that's our number one aim. I mean, if we don't have air, food and water, that's all we're interested in gaining that before we do anything else. And then we want security. We want psychological and physical security. So we don't want to be attacked in any way, shape or form. And obviously if we feel threatened, that's going to be our number one motivator. Fortunately, those two things are not prevalent in our society. So these next three are critically important to your ability to lead your team. Belonging means that everyone must feel a sense of belonging in the team. They must feel their place. And it's very interesting. So you can regress down the, this pyramid. So for example, if one of your team members left tomorrow and they went and worked for somebody else or another department, they might be at self-actualization at the top of the apex, but when they go to a new organization, they'll be at belonging. Why? Because they want to feel a sense of belonging in that organization first and foremost. They don't know that that's going to be the case until it's proven. So their motivational level has changed according to Maslow. Then they want to feel important and their opinion is being listened to. And you saw that in the, in the research before. So people want to feel that their opinion is valued and listened to. And then ultimately, if those two have been fulfilled, then they want to stretch and grow and develop as an individual. And if people who don't get that need met, they get very frustrated. So not everyone is at that self-actualization stage and belonging and making people feel heard are critically important and underestimated in terms of motivation, according to Maslow. Uh, another concept that you might like to consider is the concept of theory X and theory Y. Uh, this is an interesting model from McGregor because it argues that how a, a leader's assumption about human nature will have a huge bearing and impact, not just on their leadership style, but also, of course, the impact of that leadership style on the people that they lead. So for example, Theory X managers, you know, they think that people just inherently dislike work. Work is just a necessary evil. People will do what they can to avoid work. Um, 
you know, people will avoid and shirk responsibility and so on and so on. Now, if you've ever been led by a manager like that, I, I, you would know. I mean, you wouldn't feel very comfortable with that. But there are still a lot of managers that think like that. Now, the theory why managers the opposite. They believe that work is natural. They believe that people will accept responsibility if it's given to them in the right way, that people have the energy and the creative creativity and imagination to come up with new and better and reasonable ways of doing things. So what McGregor was actually saying is that being a theory why manager is probably a better way to be in terms of getting the best from other people. But this is based on an inside assumption of what human nature is all about. Interesting stuff. What we do know, and Daniel Pink's book Drive, The Surprising, the un, the surprising Truth About Motivation, says that the carrot and the stick no longer work to the extent that we thought they would. In fact, he argues in his book that the carrot and stick is actually detrimental. So reward and punishment for knowledge workers isn't really the best way to go. And what he argues is that we should be moving towards this model. And this model is a model which Daniel Pink argues ticks all the boxes. And if you think there's a correlation between these three things and what we went through in the top 10 list. So mastery is the capacity to grow and develop and improve. And you might recall that number 10 on the list was skill development. You might recall that number two on the list was autonomy. Um, or, or sorry, to think for yourself. So mastery is very, very important to a knowledge worker. People also want to feel a sense of autonomy. And as I said, number two on the list was autonomy. So people want to be able to have the freedom to exercise their own judgments and make their own decisions about how things are done. And thirdly, and I've sort of touched on this a bit, people want to feel a sense of purpose. And the way to do that, of course, is to understand the line of sight between what they're doing and the end result. So I want you to have a think about that, because how might you assist people to understand the relevance and the significance of the work that they're doing in relation to the bigger picture. And then not being afraid to share that with people because don't assume that people understand the relevance and the significance of the work that they do. They don't often have that and they have these blinkers on. A good leader will actually show people the why of work, the why you know, why something is important and why it should be done a certain way. So I want you, as your homework will suggest, to do those things. Now, just before I wrap up, let's summarise all of this. You need to clarify the task required clearly. So clear job task, you know, explain clearly how things, what needs to be done. You need to give relevant, positive feedback and frequent positive feedback. You need to show people how they're making a contribution, as I said before. Encourage people to set their own goals. What you need to do is match the work they're doing with their personal motivation whenever you possibly can. You need to make apparent the personal gains for team and, and uh, for personal and team productivity. In other words, show people how they can make a difference. You need to recognise people's successes. You need, wherever possible, to remove organisational blocks inside the department. Sometimes you can't, that's true, but wherever possible, you should. And you need also to look in the mirror and realise that maybe you have some blocks in terms of the way you might be leading people as well. And maybe just think about some of the things that you're doing or not doing that could contribute to that. All right, so your homework is I want you to um, go away and I want you to, to uh, use autonomy, mastery and purpose wherever it's possible. I also want you to have a check-in or a conversation with your people about their motivational drivers. Bear in mind they've completed that survey as well and I think you'll find it'll be a very interesting, useful discussion. Okay, so I want you to have a go at that. 
I think it, you'll find it very, very enlightening and very useful. And don't be afraid, of course, to share your own motivational drivers with your team members as well. I think that can be really important as well. It just opens up that connection. So folks, that's it from me. I think we're pretty much done. Um, I don't think that if there's any questions or comments, doesn't look like it. Um, all right, brilliant. Okay, well, I've really enjoyed working with you again today. I think that you've got a few things to look at. Um, we're getting close to the weekend, so have a great weekend. We'll catch up in about four weeks, uh, no, four weeks, I think, I think it's about two weeks' time. I have to check the diary on that. I'll be, of course, sending you a copy of the slides and the recording as well. So thanks, everyone, and uh, all the very best for the rest of the week. And uh, as I said before, have a really great weekend. Thank you and goodbye.